Well, then we'll start. Uh, hello, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Uh, welcome and thank you for participating in today's technical briefing, uh, which will provide an update on the COVID-19 vaccine rollout and distribution. Uh, today, we'll hear from Dr. Howard New and Major General Danny Fortin from the Public Health Agency of Canada. They are accompanied by uh, Dr. Tom Wong from Indigenous Services Canada. Aujourd'hui, nous entendons les allocutions uh, de Dr. Uh, Howard New et du Major General Danny Fortin. De la Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Canada. Howard, Howard New and Major, Major General Dr. Danny Fortin, Fortin as well as Dr. Tom Wong remarks, from Indigenous Services Canada. We will also respond to questions from the media. Suite à la présentation, nous répondrons à vos questions. If you wish to ask questions, please press star 1 on your phone now. Si vous désirez poser une question, appuyez sur étoile 1. Procédons à la séance d'information technique. Let's begin today's technical briefing. Over to you. Dr. New. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, merci, Eric. Hello, everyone. Thank and you, thank Eric. you for joining us today. I'm here with Major General Denis Fortin, Vice President of Operations and Logistics at the Public Health Agency of Canada. We will each provide brief remarks on an update to the COVID-19 vaccine rollout in Canada and then open the floor to questions. To assist us in answering your questions, we have with us Dr. Tom Wong, Chief Medical Officer of Public Health, Indigenous Services Canada. As of today, more than 1.5 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in Canada. This means that 2.9% of Canadians have received at least one dose of vaccine and 1.1% have received two doses. We're seeing positive signs that the rollout is ramping up. Last week, provinces and territories administered more than 240,000 doses of vaccines, the highest weekly number in the past five weeks. This is a reflection of greater supply. Major General Fortin will provide details on that in a minute. We expect this percentage to significantly increase throughout March. Additionally, more than 14% of seniors 80 years of age or more have received at least one dose and 5.5% have received a second dose, a promising sign that those most vulnerable to COVID-19 are being protected against infection. Whilst these numbers speak to our progress in vaccinating Canadians, scientists, Researchers, health and other experts are actively gathering, virtually sharing and discussing what they're observing in those being vaccinated. Already, we are seeing evidence that the COVID-19 vaccines approved for use in Canada are highly effective at preventing illness. Every day, we obtain more evidence that will help us strengthen our ability to fight COVID-19. For now, however, COVID-19 remains a serious threat. The new COVID-19 variants are unpredictable and can spread at a worrying pace. I realize I'm saying this as provinces and territories are reopening, and that is my point. Just because we are now allowed to resume activities like going to the gym or a pub doesn't necessarily mean we should. Determine what you need to do and assess your risks. To minimize risks, Canadians, even those who have received two vaccine doses, should follow their local public health measures, especially wearing a face mask and avoiding the three Cs, closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with many people nearby and close contact where you can't stay two meters apart from others. By doing this, you will help slow the spread of COVID-19 and variants in your communities. Thank you. Bonjour à toutes et à tous et merci d'être ici. Hello everyone and thank you for joining today. I am here with Major General Danny Fortin, Vice President of Operations and Logistics at the Public Health Agency of Canada. We will each provide brief remarks on an update to the COVID-19 vaccine rollout in Canada and then open the floor to questions. To assist us in answering your questions, we have with us Dr. Tom Wong, Chief Medical Officer of Public Health, Indigenous Services Canada. As of today, more than 1.5 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in Canada. This means that 2.9% of Canadians have received at least one dose of vaccine and 1.1% have received two doses. We're seeing positive signs that the rollout is ramping up. Last week, provinces and territories administered more than 240,000 doses of vaccines, the highest weekly number in the past five weeks. This is a reflection of greater supply. Major General Fortin will provide details on that in a minute. 
We expect this percentage to significantly increase throughout March. Additionally, more than 14% of seniors 80 years of age or, or, or older have received at least one dose and 5.5% have received a second dose, a promising sign that the, those most vulnerable to COVID-19 are being protected against infection. While these numbers speak to our progress in vaccinating Canadians, Scientists, researchers, health and other experts are actively gathering virtually, gathering virtually rather, sharing and discussing what they are observing in those being vaccinated. Already, we are seeing evidence that the COVID-19 vaccines approved for use in Canada are highly effective at preventing illness. Every day, we obtain more evidence that will help us strengthen our ability to fight COVID-19. For now, however, COVID-19 remains a serious threat. The new COVID-19 variants are unpredictable and can spread at a worrying pace. I realize I am saying this as provinces and territories are reopening, and that is my point. Just because we are now allowed to resume activities, like going to the gym or a pub, doesn't mean necessarily that we should. Determine what you need to do and assess your risks. To minimize risks, Canadians, even those who have received two vaccine doses, should follow their local public health measures, especially wearing a face mask, and avoid the three Cs. Closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with many people nearby, and close contact where you can't stay two meters apart from others. By doing this, you will help slow the spread of COVID-19 and variants in your communities. Thank you. Major General Fortin, if you could now provide your remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. To date, we have distributed nearly two and a half million doses of both Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines uh, to provinces and territories. This week alone, Canada saw uh, an amount, its largest amount so far, with 643,000 doses distributed across the country. Starting next week, we anticipate having 444,000 doses weekly uh, in March. By the end of this quarter, we will have distributed 4 million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech. Uh, this is all good news for Canadians. We're hoping to get vaccinated, who are hoping to get vaccinated. And we're pleased to say that we have now visibility on expected shipments of Pfizer-BioNTech into the first weeks of April. Based on discussions with the manufacturer, we anticipate to receive approximately 769,000 doses of vaccines a week for the first two weeks of, in April. In total, we're expecting to receive over 10 million doses between April and June from Pfizer-BioNTech. Now, Moderna has confirmed that 466,000 doses will be delivered to Canada in the week of March 8th, and another shipment in the week of March 22nd. That will bring uh, 846 additional Moderna doses to the country for a total expected of 1.3 million. So with these two shipments in March, Moderna will round out their first quarter commitment of 2 million doses. We're still working with the manufacturer to confirm the exact uh, dates uh, to come for uh, doses and dates to come for their uh, second quarter shipments. We we'll regularly shape, share updates with provinces and territories and will inform Canadians of any development uh, in a timely manner. Now, as we head into spring, we are collectively gearing up for what we call the ramp up phase. We have been closely planning with provinces and territories to be able to provide support to their immunization strategies and align the logistical service provider, the logistical service provider with the distribution needs. These continued planning efforts will culminate on March 9th when we will conduct a rehearsal of concept. We uh, expect to see more than 100 uh, participants from federal, provincial, territorial governments, indigenous partners and key stakeholders to validate uh, the planning that has taken place to date 
So we're all ready and prepared for the increase, uh, increasing shipment size of authorized COVID-19 vaccines starting in April. In conclusion, over the past months, our collective efforts have set the appropriate conditions for an effective scale up as production lines start ramping up. Moving ahead, our planning is focused on increasing shipments from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna beyond April, uh, between April and June. Hello, everyone. To date, we have distributed nearly 2.5 million doses of both Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines to provinces and territories. This week alone, Canada has received its largest amount for one week with 640. 3,000 doses combined of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines to be delivered across the country. Starting next week, we anticipate having 444,000 doses weekly delivered in March. By the end of this quarter, we will have distributed 4 million doses, doses of Pfizer BioNTech as planned. This is all good news for Canadians who are hoping to, be, to get vaccinated, vaccinated. And we are pleased to say that we now also have visibility on the expected shipments from Pfizer BioNTech for early April. Based on discussions with the manufacturer, we anticipate receiving approximately 769,000 vaccine doses a week for the first two weeks of April. In total, we are expecting to receive over 10 million doses between April and June from Pfizer BioNTech. Moderna has confirmed that 460,000 doses will be delivered to Canada in the week of March 8, and another shipment in the week of March 22 will bring 846,000 additional Moderna doses to the country. With these two confirmed shipments in March, Moderna will round out their first quarter commitment of 2 million doses. We are still working with the manufacturer to confirm the exact doses and dates for the second quarter shipments. We, will regularly, we regularly share updates with the province and territories and will inform Canadians of any development in a timely manner. As we head into spring, we are collectively gearing up to what we call the ramp up phase. We have been closely planning with the provinces and territories to be able to provide support to their immunization strategies and align the logistical service provider with the distribution needs. These continued planning efforts will culminate on March 9, when we will conduct a rehearsal of concept. More than 100 participants from federal, provincial and territorial governments, indigenous partners and key stakeholders will meet to validate the plan, the planning that has taken place. So we are all ready and prepared for the increasing shipment size of authorized COVID-19 vaccines starting in April. In conclusion, over the, the past months, our collective efforts have set the appropriate conditions for an effective scale-up as production lines start ramping up. And start ramping up and increasing their deliveries to Canada. Moving ahead, our planning, planning is focused on increasing shipments expected from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna between April and June. Thank you. Thank you, Major General Forte. We will now uh, open the telephone line to questions. Uh, if you have any questions, please press star one on your phone. We will now uh, start with the first question. Operator, over to you. Thank you. Merci. Uh, again, yes, if you have a question, please press star one. Si vous avez des questions, faites étoile un. You will have a brief pause while the participants register. Courte pause pendant que les participants se fassent étoile 1. La première question est de Catherine Lévesque. First question, canadienne. Catherine Lévesque from the uh, Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Major General Fortin, with regard to the Moderna numbers, I'm wondering at what time the company confirmed delivery for March. I'm also wondering if we should understand that from now on, uh, inaudible for the interpreter. 
Answer. We're constantly in talks with manufacturers. Yesterday, they confirmed what we were expecting in terms of deliveries in the month of March, what the numbers I've just given you. The manufacturer can now proceed with deliveries every two weeks. That's what we were told. Uh, and that will begin with the deliveries in March. It will be confirmed in the covering, coming weeks what we can expect to receive in April, but the number of vaccines rece received should increase. Follow-up question? Yes. On another subject, I'd like to hear Major General Fortin on the announcement made about the Chief of Defense Staff, Art McDonald, that there will be an investigation carried out about, uh, about him. I'm wondering about this toxic... Uh, uh, workplace. Answer, I'm aware that Admiral Art McDonald uh, voluntarily withdrew from his position for the time being this morning. I don't have any other comments to make. The investigation will, uh, will be, take due course. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, Ryan Tumulty, National Post. Line open. Yeah, uh, good morning. This question is for uh, Dr. New. I'm working on a story about um, the government's modeling efforts uh, when it comes to the pandemic. Um, I noticed you've, every time you've done the modeling, you've included a range which has almost always been accurate and um, has held up. You've also included the sort of worst case, best case scenarios uh, with the blue line and gray line and the orange line. I'm wondering if that part of the modeling is meant to act as a warning, because I know it always includes provisos that, you know, if we if we lower restrictions or gather more, is that what you're trying to do with that modeling? Um, well, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, it's so much as a warning uh, as to just basically uh, uh, further reinforce the point to Canadians that our actions matter. You know, what you do today certainly yeah. will have consequences down the road. And uh, depending on the degree of uh, how much uh, Canadians uh, either continue to follow public health measures or not, uh, uh, that will determine uh, what uh, might uh, be uh, the situation, you know, uh, several weeks down the line. Uh, the other point I would make uh, uh, now is that uh, the modeling, I think, is uh, is, is quite complex. So when Dr. Tam and I present, we certainly want to present it in a format that, that, that makes sense and Canadians can understand it. But uh, I would say now that uh, we're getting to, uh, I think, a, a very, uh, I think a very good, but uh, uh, interesting time in which, in my view, there, there are sort of like uh, three sort of factors that we need to take into account. Uh, the issue of public health measures, uh, how well Canadians are continuing to follow the public health measures, uh, what happens in the uh, uh, the different provinces with respect to uh, either lifting uh, or, or, or putting uh, more restrictive public health measures, that all helps determine sort of the degree and number of contacts between people. The other part also that well, we're starting to take a look at, but uh, certainly haven't uh, put it into place now, uh, up to now, because uh, it's uh, it's really been a sort of a, a small percentage of Canadians who've been vaccinated, uh, is that uh, today that hasn't been part of our modeling, but moving forward, we're going to take obviously a, a deeper dive into that because as the ramp, as the vaccine rollout ramps up and we get uh, more and more Canadians vaccinated, that'll be also another factor to consider. And then, of course, uh, the third one, which interacts with the other two, is the emergence of variants. And we all know that uh, we're all in, within the public health community quite concerned about the emergence of variants. So, so that's another factor to take into account. So as the modeling uh, 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 proceeds in the coming weeks and months. And those are at least three major things that we'll, look, uh, we'll be looking at. Thanks. Thank you. Follow up? Yeah, uh, Doug, you, know, you, you mentioned the variants just there. I noticed in the most recent modeling, you had scenarios that sort of factored them in and, and, and scenarios that didn't. Do they make predicting um, where the pandemic is headed uh, that much more difficult? I, I wouldn't say that makes it more difficult, but uh, it, it is, uh, I think, uh, more um, challenging to predict because at the end of the day, it all depends also on sort of human behavior, the number of interactions and, uh, you know, whether uh, there's a, a sustained community transmission of, of, of the variants. Uh, 
Uh, certainly we've seen in, in, in jurisdictions such as uh, Newfoundland and Labrador that uh, uh, when you have an outbreak and, and suddenly the number of cases uh, increases exponentially, which was also the case in uh, other countries like uh, in, in the UK, uh, that's a first indication that uh, you're probably dealing with a variant. And uh, I think it was really, in a sense, after the fact that uh, when we did the uh, genetic uh, sequencing that uh, it was determined to be uh, the variant, I think in this case, B117, uh, which I think... Uh, uh, the authorities there, as well as ourselves here at the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, sort of uh, were guessing would probably be the case. And I think uh, it, it just shows that uh, uh, we can't let our guard down. Uh, Newfoundland and Labrador had it well controlled, I think, in terms of overall for COVID-19 uh, up to a certain point. And then uh, it shows that uh, uh, the introduction of just one or a few uh, cases of, of the variant can certainly lead to exponential growth. So yes, it is worrying and it's hard to, to predict. Uh, a lot of provinces now uh, uh, obviously, all 10 provinces have reported cases uh, with the variants and uh, uh, different types of outbreaks in different settings. So it's something that, that we're certainly keeping an eye on, uh, both nationally, but obviously uh, within the individual provinces and territories. Thank you, Dr. New. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. La prochaine question, Annie Bergeron-Olivier. The next National question, News. CTV National I News. Oh, hi, thank you so much for taking my question. This is for Dr. New. Uh, the FDA is expected to make a decision tomorrow on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and it said that it could approve it as early as tomorrow night with shipment immediately. I'm wondering if you know where Health Canada is in that process, and I also know that we've ordered, I believe, 10 million doses of J&J. &J. I'm wondering if you know how quickly those doses can be delivered to Canadians upon approval. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a two-part question. Uh, I, I have no line of sight in terms of, quote, delivery dates, and maybe a Major General uh, Faulkner uh, may have some more uh, intel on that. Uh, with respect to the regulatory process, as uh, I stated uh, on numerous occasions, uh, really it's an independent process by the regula regulators at Health Canada, so I, I have no line of sight in terms of uh, how the process is unfolding. What I will say, though, is that uh, uh, they are going through their due diligence. I think Canadians can rest assured that uh, we have one of the uh, most stringent, I would say, regulatory processes are in the world. Uh, that uh, certainly that this, uh, the safety and effectiveness uh, of any vaccine or any product that gets approved by Health Canada will have gone through a rigorous process. And I understand that they're also looking at the data right now. Uh, they're receiving uh, information from the company. And uh, I, I I would just leave it at that and say that uh, certainly they're working as quickly as possible, but I, I really don't have a, uh, a line of sight in terms of when uh, that uh, decision might be uh, forthcoming. Thank you. Thank you. Follow-up? Yes, my follow-up is for um, Mr. Forte. Uh, yesterday, General Hillier in Ontario said he didn't quite want to stick to the September timeline. He said he was reluctant to commit to getting everyone in Ontario a vaccine by September. And he said he was reluctant to do that because of vaccine shipments and the fact that there have been delays coming from Pfizer and Moderna, and in some cases, no shipments at all. So it seems like there's a little bit of a lack of confidence in Ontario that the federal government will be able to get the vaccine shipments it's promising delivered in time to the provinces. I'm wondering what you can say about the future of these vaccines, how confident you are that they will arrive without any delay. And when you mentioned the 765 doses expected in the coming weeks, is that only from Pfizer or is that a Pfizer-Moderna combined? So um, I, I think it's fair to say that provinces um, have reasons to uh, be hesitant about uh, the way forward because we have, uh, we have seen over the last several weeks uh, scarcity of vaccines and um, delay in shipments. Um, but we're coming out of this and coming out strong. And as I indicated, uh, just uh, well over 2 million of uh, Pfizer coming at us in the next month. Um, so we'll round out the 4 million of Pfizer. We'll round out the 2 million of uh, Moderna. Those numbers on Moderna were unknown um, until midday yesterday. So I, I can understand why uh, those numbers, in addition to the 769,000 uh, 769, a week for Pfizer for the first two weeks of uh, April, it's good news, welcome news for provinces and territories, and that will build confidence at all levels. So uh, I am confident 
with the information and the trends that we that we see, with the dialogue that we have with the manufacturers, that we are on track uh, to have a significant increase into the spring and again into the summer. Uh, and the number, the projections that we have see uh, 88,000, sorry, 88 million vaccines of both approved products in country by September. Thank you. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Marika Walsh, The Globe and Mail. Line open. Hi there. Thanks for taking our questions. Major General, I, I'm not sure if I misheard you, but uh, the Prime Minister, I believe last week or the week before, announced that we were getting 10.8 million shots from Pfizer between April and May. Um, can you just clarify, sorry, between April and June, can you just clarify if that's the number you're working with? I thought I just heard you say 10 million. Yeah, apologies for the confusion. It's 10.8 million. That's the number that we're working with uh, for April to June inclusive. And can you give any more specifics on how the federal government is helping provinces roll out the vaccine or whether it is? The Prime Minister said yesterday that the federal government is, but as we saw yesterday um, from Ontario, they seem to not have um, everything ready right now, and their timeline for vaccinating people is slower than others. So, so what specifically is the federal government doing to help provinces get ready? Well, I think provinces and uh, provinces are at different levels of readiness uh, in their plans. Uh, my job, our job here at the agency, is to set the favorable conditions for their um, for provinces and territories. Uh, to, to optimize their plans. And um, we're very much focusing on supporting provinces and their plans uh, moving forward uh, into the spring. Uh, while we uh, work on establishing a distribution network that's pretty pretty solid now, uh, we have all the mechanisms in place for ordering and, and distributing. Um, provinces are now uh, in a position to fully deploy their immunization plans. The best way we can support them is to give them predictability on number of vaccines they uh, expect to see and when. I think all provinces, not speaking on behalf of provinces, but I think they would all agree that um, they are uh, ready. Um, they have different um, different uh, distribution uh, and immunization um, processes in place, whether it's uh, super vaccination or mega vaccination sites or mobile clinics or drive through uh, clinics. Uh, those are all things that they are putting in place and they line up the appropriate uh, health workforce to do that as we scale up. But it's hard to do that if you don't have a good sense of how many doses and when. And uh, we're providing that now as, as we receive it. So um, we have weeks of visibility. We have visibility weeks ahead in Pfizer. Uh, we have uh, through the end of March for, um, for Moderna, as I said, on a two-week cycle for Moderna. So uh, uh, as we get visibility into the coming months, uh, that will help them tremendously. I would add that we're uh, we're shared. We share with them projections. We're we're about to share a Statistics Canada uh, tool that uh, gives you more fidelity on the population, um, of the demographics in your jurisdiction. Uh, as well as a playbook that we've been developing that uh, that offers uh, a wide range of ideas, things that we've um, identified with provinces and, and other stakeholders and territories. And uh, the 9th of March um, will be a, an opportunity to come together and really compare notes uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, that won't be the end of it. Uh, there will be additional discussions uh, down the road as required. And as we get more vaccines approved and available, they will also be part of the planning. But they already have uh, scenarios where uh, those vaccines could come, uh, uh, could be distributed to uh, those jurisdictions and, and what that means to them in their plans. Thank you very much. Operator, next question. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Tom Perry, CBC News. Line open. 
Oh, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, my first question is for Major General Fortin. Uh, Major General, you were talking about that rehearsal of concept happening on March the 9th. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, who's going to be involved? What are you kind of rehearsing for? What are you try hoping comes out of this exercise? What are you hoping to learn? Well, it's a, it's an opportunity to, to have uh, representatives uh, with the distribution, immunization, uh, health officials, uh, really the provinces and territories are invited to participate. Uh, so based on historic uh, uh, data and the last time we did this um, in December, um, we can expect well over 100 people uh, connecting virtually to this, uh, to this opportunity to discuss. What I uh, uh, what we all hope to see is uh, um, provinces sharing uh, important parts of their plan and their considerations, and see where we could be value added in addition to what we've been doing so far. Uh, it's not a it's not a um, it's not a discussion about different variables and and conditions. It's very much about their plans, uh, our input, what we can do to leverage, uh, how we can leverage the. Um, the logistics, uh, logistics um, service provider, how we can reposition, uh, pr reprioritize freezers and so on and so forth. So a lot of planning has uh, taken place, a lot of discussions have taken place. And coming out of this, a measure of success for me would be a good sharing of best practices and ideas between provinces uh, and have an opportunity to hear from provinces and uh, shine a light on some areas that require additional uh, work over the following weeks, days and weeks. And uh, my, my second question is for Dr. New. Um, Dr. New, I mean, everyone's asking about, you know, when life is going to be getting back to normal. I'd just like to know what your advice is for people who are now getting their first shots, maybe even their second shots. How soon do, was it, is it going to be before these people are going to be able to get their lives back to normal? What, what, what's your opinion on that? Well, as I mentioned uh, in my uh, opening remarks, uh, there's a lot of uh, things that we still don't know about the vaccines. Uh, certainly, the, the early evidence is very good in terms of uh, a level of protection, especially against severe disease. Uh, I think uh, people around the world, the researchers, the experts are looking at the evidence in terms of uh, how well do the vaccines uh, protect against asymptomatic infection, as well as transmission. I think uh, the evidence is coming in. Uh, some is promising, some uh, 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 also uh, uh, gives us, I guess, pause to say that uh, even if you are vaccinated, uh, you may have a certain level of protection for yourself in terms of uh, not getting severe disease. But I think uh, uh, people should understand that uh, in terms of uh, whether uh, you could still transmit to others, that's still a bit of an open question. And so I think, uh, I think bottom line is that I think uh, in many ways, uh, life won't get back to, to normal the way we understood it. Uh, uh, even for those people who have uh, received the two doses of vaccine. I think everyone, I think it's probably uh, uh, straightforward and, and, and simple to say, yes, let's continue practicing the good public health measures. I think a lot of the personal behaviors uh, have become second nature for, 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 for many people uh, in, in terms of using uh, you know, uh, the masks, uh, uh, keeping your distance from others and, and sort of minimizing your, your uh, 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 encounters with other, other people. So I would say that, that that's something we need to keep in mind. Uh, as more and more Canadians become vaccinated, I think uh, uh, we'll, we'll look at the data and, and see uh, uh, what the, what the incident, incidence rate is, uh, how, uh, I guess, uh, hospitalizations and, and, and the mortality rate uh, hopefully are also trending in the right direction. But as I also mentioned before, it's not just a matter of what happens here, you know, even locally or in a province uh, or territory or even uh, Canada as a whole, like the whole world is, 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 uh, is uh, dealing with a global pandemic. And so, uh, when people talk about uh, returning a life to normal, I think a large part of that, and I think, uh, you know, it's obviously uh, uh, important for many people. Dr. Nair, I think we lost the last portion of that question. Um, maybe we can move over to the next question. Operator. Thank you. Merci. It is from Vic Adopia, CBC National News. Line open. 
good morning. Uh, my question is about variants of concern. Two independent teams uh, in the U.S. have identified the B1526 variant of concern. It shares the same mutation with the uh, two variants uh, first identified in Brazil and South Africa, suggests older patients are more susceptible and will have a more severe outcome. So my question is for Dr. New, what, uh, what efforts are underway to uh, identify emerging new variants of concern and um, identifying them and, uh, and, and where they originate? Sorry, Vic, I think we have some technical difficulties on the uh, video conference side of things. Uh, we'll just pause for a moment and see if it can uh, come back to, uh, to normal. Okay. Dr. New, est-ce que vous êtes toujours connecté? Major Général Fortin, est-ce que vous êtes euh, toujours connecté? Oui, tout à fait. Dr. Wong, est-ce que uh, are you still connected? Oui. Oh oui, tout à fait. We are trying to connect with the Dr. New through teleconference um, and uh, the press conference will restart very shortly.
Jeez. <laughs> Adobe, CB, CBC National News, line open. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, thanks again. Uh, question for Dr. New. Um, I'm not sure if you heard the question about the variants of concern, the new one identified in New York by two independent teams of uh, researchers. It, it contains the same mutation associated with the Brazilian and South African uh, variants uh, where it does seem to affect older patients more severely. So my question is, um, what efforts are underway to identify uh, these emerging variants of concern in Canada? Can you hear me? It's, uh, it's Dr. New. I just want to make sure with the disconnect. Yes. Connect. Okay. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay. Hopefully I'm not talking too loud. So, uh, yeah, apologies uh, for the technological issues. So, yeah, I would say that uh, certainly we're taking the issue of variants uh, very seriously uh, here in Canada. And I think uh, we've mentioned it uh, a couple of times. Uh, from the laboratory perspective, uh, uh, our National Microbiology Laboratory is working closely with the provincial and territorial counterparts uh, uh, to to uh, to uh, basically pool their resources and look at uh, doing uh, genetic sequencing uh, of samples. Uh, it doesn't make sense at, pres at the present time to try and uh, do genetic sequencing because it take, takes time for every single sample. So certainly they're doing it uh, with the uh, I say with uh, sort of a focus. Uh, they're also leveraging I think. Uh, Canco Gene and, and other partners uh, in academic centers to uh, harness sort of the uh, sort of the, uh, the power of a uh, 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 capability of, of genetic sequencing uh, for the variants. What I would say is that uh, at, the, at the beginning we were doing genetic sequencing of about five percent of all the sort of the uh, the, the cases in which we had uh, samples. Now we're aiming for uh, about ten percent. And I think that is uh, also the target in, in most of the larger provinces. Uh, having said that, though, uh, what the provinces are also doing, I, I, I think, uh, for the most part, is that uh, they're also doing what we, what we call, what call an initial screen. So when they actually uh, do the sample, uh, they will look for a certain mutation, uh, let's say, the, in this case, very technically, the N501Y, which uh, to this point has been a common uh, mutation for the variants detected so far in Canada. And if that is there as sort of a part of the initial screen, then they will go forward with the full genetic sequencing of that particular sample. Um, that will still take a, a few days. Uh, having said that, uh, they're also uh, looking at, uh, to, to uh, uh, put in a priority uh, sequencing for certain types of situations. Uh, certainly, if, let's say, there's a case that's uh, uh, been associated with multiple uh, uh, other cases, contacts, uh, there's evidence that maybe it's a super spreader event. Certainly, uh, uh, that type of situation, like an outbreak in a, in, in a nursing home, uh, will, will certainly take precedence in terms of genetic sequencing. As well, we're also looking, uh, uh, certainly, what, with what we're doing at our borders for any uh, uh, case that's, uh, that's travel-related. So, if it's an incoming uh, uh, sort of a traveler that uh, it turns out that COVID-19, that will also be uh, something looked at very closely in terms of doing the genetic sequencing. And then also, finally, certainly for, for individuals, the cases, people have been uh, vaccinated. That's another uh, situation where I think uh, definitely we want to do look at the genetic sequencing to determine if, what, uh, if there is what we call vaccine escape, uh, whether there, there's maybe variant at play that might have uh, had an impact in terms of the vaccine effectiveness. So hopefully that answers your question. It's a multi-pronged approach, uh, a good collaboration between a uh, federal level, a uh, provincial, territorial level, and also uh, with other partners to uh, have a good surveillance system in place to detect variants. Thank you. Thank you, Vic. Do you have a follow-up? And sorry for technical issues earlier. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for your answer, uh, Dr. New. So, yes, my follow-up question is um, this uh, New York variant, the B1526, as it's being called, is that on, uh, on your radar? Or is it on you know, Canada's radar in terms of any sort of uh, prevalence of this at all? Well, it is on our radar because as, uh, certainly we, we always have very good uh, connections, uh, both, uh, you know, obviously within Canada, as I just mentioned, but also with uh, uh, other uh, uh, authorities around the world, in this case, obviously with our American counterparts. So certainly it's, uh, quote, as they say, on the radar to, 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 to date. And, uh, as far as I know, we haven't detected that specific variant, but certainly uh, as part of the, the ongoing uh, surveillance and, and sort of laboratory uh, uh, work that's going on that that's certainly, as you say, on the radar. So uh, our, our our colleagues at the National Microbiology Laboratory, along with their counterparts, are they're always on the lookout for, as you say, uh, variants. Uh, the one thing I, I would also say is that 
uh, I think has been mentioned before, the actual fact that uh, the virus continues to mutate and, uh, and and so on is natural. That's just the way that the virus adapts, uh, you know, as it tries to uh, uh, be able to sort of uh, continue to propagate uh, from human to human. Where it becomes important from uh, from our perspective is whether uh, the, the mutation or the combination mutation is enough uh, in terms of uh, causing a, a certain variant that has either both clinical significance or public health significance. And uh, really, it's, it, it's sort of in three uh, sort of main categories. For one, does it actually uh, uh, have an impact in terms of transmissibility? And we've seen with the variants to date in Canada that uh, uh, certainly they, they've shown to be more transmissible. So that's uh, certainly a, of significance. Uh, uh, the second part uh, that we're also looking at is that whether it has a significance in terms of causing more severe disease. There's some evidence that there's some of the variants do uh, cause more severe disease, and that's something that's still uh, sort of actively being looked at. And then the third point is, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, is uh, looking at whether uh, any of these variants actually have an impact uh, in terms of the, the vaccines that are currently uh, authorized in Canada, and also for some of the others that uh, may come down the pipeline. And certainly we're aware that, uh, for example, companies like Pfizer and Moderna are continuously looking at it in a laboratory setting, uh, uh, with these variants to see uh, what the impact might be on the vaccines. And uh, certainly they're looking at potentially down the road, uh, should there be any modifications or adjustments necessary. So there's a lot of work going on in the area of uh, looking at the variants and their potential implications uh, uh, for public health. Thanks. Thank you. Alper, next question. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Mia Robson, the Canadian Press. Line open. Hi, I'm just wondering, Dr. New or, or Major General Fortin, if either of you could give an update on how the provinces have been finding the six-dose extraction so far. We're sort of, I guess, uh, well into that uh, period. I'm just wondering what reports we've we've had back of how well it's working or how hard it's, it's been to get that sixth dose. Danny, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Um, so. Uh, the, uh, the six dose is relatively new to uh, provinces. Uh, we are monitoring the reporting uh, of the provinces through the National Operations Center here uh, on their ability to consistently draw that six dose. Uh, we are putting in place a, um, a uh, process uh, uh, by which they will uh, uh, report that up uh, and ensure that we have visibility on the success rate. We're also uh, continue to push the appropriate uh, loaded volume syringe and ancillary equipment that's required, uh, and um, and we'll monitor that very closely. Hello? Hello? Hello, I think we may have lost uh, Major General Forte, uh, unfortunately. Oh. Uh, Dr. Nidhi, do you want to so add to that response? Am I here? Am I yeah, here? yeah, you're there. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, um, so I'll repeat my uh, my answer. I'm sorry if that didn't go through. Um, so the six those is uh, relatively, relatively new um, with uh, provinces. And remember, we just received uh, last week and this week large shipments. So uh, there will be uh, more opportunities, more numbers um, to go off of. Uh, but we're monitoring the reporting of their ability to administer the six dose or to draw the six dose uh, from the National Operations Center. Uh, and um, and, and if, if they're able to draw that consistently, <clears throat> consistently, um, with the supplied uh, low dead volume syringes that we've pushed out, we'll continue to push more of those syringes to our provinces, um, and uh, and uh, very very soon I would expect to see uh, numbers from provinces on their ability to draw that consistently. Thank you, Mia. Do you have a follow up? Uh, yeah, I'm also wondering, um, now that we're getting more and more doses of Pfizer, I believe that back in December you talked about just a, sort of like a dozen sites, but that we were supposed to expand to several hundred, I think, in the end for deliveries. I'm just wondering if you could give an update on 
how many sites we now have for deliveries, and also what impact on those sites or the deliveries it will have, assuming Canada follows the U.S. and makes the the change so that it can be stored, Pfizer can be stored uh, for a couple of weeks at a warmer temperature. So this week alone, we had 107 uh, different uh, vaccine delivery sites for Pfizer products. Some of those uh, delivery sites can be dual use with Moderna. Some are just Moderna. Clearly, Moderna is we're trying to push that to remote indigenous communities and into the territories uh, where Pfizer does not go. Uh, overall, uh, provinces have turned on, turned off uh, vaccine delivery sites. Some have uh, stayed on throughout because of the realities, their requirements uh, in the various locations. Um, moving forward, if uh, if if and when uh, Pfizer uh, submits this uh, this uh, request or this application to Health Canada, and then uh, if approved, this change means that there will be more storage options throughout the country, where we can have a mix of uh, vaccines stored uh, at minus uh, sixty to eighty, um, and then uh, or sent uh, with thermal shippers to locations where they can be stored at. Uh, in normal pharmaceutical freezers at minus 20, and then pharmaceutical uh, fridges uh, between two to eight degrees for a period of five days. So all of that will give us more options uh, and provinces uh, uh, increase ability, increase flexibility to vaccinate that scale. Thank you, Major General. For time, we have time for one more question. Operator, last question, please. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Merci. It is from the clan, the barb. Global News, Ottawa. Line open. Hi, thank you both of you for taking my question. This first one is for uh, either of you. So as we're seeing uh, countries approve vaccines like the AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson shot, uh, what's your message to Canadians who are worried we're falling behind and watching these other approvals from around the world? And how can additional additional vaccine approvals uh, affect and accelerate reopening plans? Uh, okay, if it's Dr. and you, maybe I'll start. Um, certainly, from from what uh, Major General Fortin has said, and then certainly uh, I'll, I'll let him uh, sort of elaborate further as as, as he uh, would like to. Is that uh, based on the two approved vaccines that we have and the uh, anticipated you know delivery and, and shipments, uh, we'll have more than enough uh, vaccines between uh, sort of the two of them uh, to be able to offer uh, all Canadians uh, who want to be vaccinated. To, and we're eligible to receive a vaccine, uh, you know, by by September, as we've indicated uh, uh, numerous times. Uh, what I would say then is that uh, as additional uh, vaccines uh, are potentially approved in Canada, that can only uh, sort of uh, uh, add to the confidence Canadians have, because we would have then, as I, I think I've said previously, uh, a larger suite of vaccines uh, to be able to to offer uh, Canadians. I think. Uh, our National Advisory Community Immunization is doing a lot of good work right now in anticipation uh, of uh, other vaccines be, uh, becoming uh, potentially approved. Uh, looking at the sort of the profile, uh, looking at the evidence and the experience and the information we have, uh, even with respect to the experience uh, uh, of those other vaccines as they're being used in other countries around the world. And uh, that will help inform uh, us in terms of how we may be using it uh, here in Canada as well. Obviously, our regulators are receiving uh, rolling submissions uh, for some of the uh, the companies, uh, obviously AstraZeneca and so on, that have actually uh, already submitted to to Health Canada. And uh, as those vaccines get approved, and we have our advanced purchase agreements, I think they would only add to uh, sort of the uh, quantity and also the uh, sort of the the the, 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 the more I think uh, earlier shipment of of. Uh, of more vaccines in Canada, and certainly the problems of the territories, I think, are also planning to uh, then see how uh, the various vaccines fit in terms of their overall approach to uh, vaccinating uh, Canadians. So I think I'll leave it at that and then pass it over to uh, Major General Fortin for any additional comments. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Dr. New. I would simply add uh, this next month alone, we will receive over 3 million doses. Um, of the 6 million doses uh, of both approved vaccines. And in terms of those two approved vaccines alone, 23 million in the in the April to June timeframe. So uh, as additional vaccines come online, uh, they will be added to that mix and I'll give more uh, opportunity, more options, more flexibility to provinces. 
Um, I think that clearly um, the more vaccines come online, and as as the as the um, as the supply increases, uh, the throughput increases with provinces uh, uh, able to uh, vaccinate at scale, the demand will also increase, and this um, this uh, equation will see a whole lot of Canadians vaccinate rapidly. Um, and in line with the NACI recommendation, uh, the proper groups will be um, uh, vaccinated in priority, as uh, as Dr. New indicated. Uh, but I see uh, with those numbers alone, a, a large quantity of uh, a large number of Canadians vaccinated by summer. With more vaccines coming in the order of 50 million in the uh, uh, June to September timeframe. So, uh, so plenty of vaccines to vaccinate Canadians by September. Thank you, Major General Fortin. Uh, follow up? Yeah, uh, this one is specifically for Dr. New. Um, so this is uh, about uh, visiting elderly parents and grandparents. So uh, a lot of people are wondering, um, after uh, vaccines start to roll out to the more, high, more people uh, who are higher at risk, will it be safe for an individual who is not vaccinated, for example, to visit uh, an elderly parent or grandparent? Uh, what message do you have uh, for people in this situation, uh, how might we see larger policy shifts on this? I think it's still early days. Obviously, as, I, as we said previously, uh, we're looking at the experience of, of vaccination efforts around the world and looking at, at vaccine effectiveness. Uh, uh, the early indications, uh, certainly uh, in terms of what's happened in our long-term care facilities, uh, there's been good results in terms of the level of protection after one dose. In terms of a larger policy shift, I, I would say that uh, uh, we need to have that discussion as we always do well, with our counterparts, uh, the chief medical officers of health uh, across the country at the special advisory committee to uh, share our, you know, our individual collective experiences and, uh, and see how that uh, uh, would translate in terms of what, uh, uh, what could or should happen in individual jurisdictions. Uh, I think it's difficult uh, for me to sort of pronounce uh, sort of a uh, on, on a very sort of, a, I think, a complex issue right now. Uh, I think uh, at the present time, I think uh, probably uh, the best thing to say is that individuals should follow, obviously, the advice and direction of local public health authorities. I would say that even with vaccination, uh, I, I don't think uh, we're out of the woods. And even for those people who are vaccinated, I think uh, it, it should still be, a, I think, hopefully a, a sort of a, a maintenance of good sort of personal uh, sort of a protective measures uh, uh, it may not be for yourself, but also in terms of uh, uh, protecting others, because we don't know about, you know, as I mentioned before, the transmission aspect uh, for those who are vaccinated and so on. So at this point, uh, yeah, it's a live issue. Uh, we'll continue to follow the data as we always do, and and the best science uh, uh, that that that's, uh, that uh, uh, that 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 uh, we know of in terms of the evidence as we move forward. Thanks. Merci beaucoup, Dr. New. That will be all for today's technical briefing. C'est ce qui met fin au briefage technique pour aujourd'hui. Thank you very much and have a good day.